if you want to understand classical education, you got to first understand the Greeks and the Romans, obviously. You've all, I'm sure, heard that many times. But one thing you really need to understand is their idea of virtue, because to them, to the Greeks and the Romans of the classical era, virtue was education. The whole point was to actually cr create virtuous men uh, for their states, for their city-states, for their polis. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is that when we talk about virtue in the classical sense, we are not talking about morality. A virtuous person uh, might be a moral person, but that isn't what the Greeks and the Romans in the, in the classical era thought virtue to be. Virtue was a thing that could, was a quality that could be possessed by anything. In fact, uh, I was thinking about it as I walked up on this stage. Um, these kind of makeshift stages that you piece together, they're a little uh, rickety, or at least they sound rickety. I mean, I'm sure it's very strong and very good. Um, but it just it creates that feeling that you're not standing on flat ground, right? Well, you're not. And uh, you can feel a little bit of movement, and, and you just get nervous. You get nervous that you're going to maybe trip or something along those lines. Why do I say all of this? Because to a Greek, uh, an item, an object could possess the quality of virtue. All that virtue entailed was that a thing did its job well. Whatever it was created to do, whatever it was built to do, it was virtuous if it did its job well. And if it did not do its job well, then it was vicious, okay? So vice being the opposite of virtue, what the Greeks wanted to do is they wanted to cultivate virtue and they wanted to put away vice, all right? And again, you know, you think about anything, all the tools that we use, chairs. I think of these chairs. These are incredibly virtuous chairs. They're virtuous chairs because they're quite comfortable. I mean, we sit, sit around, I've sat around here all day and, and I feel good sitting in these chairs. They actually... Uh, recline a little bit, which is kind of weird. I was not expecting that. At first I thought, oh no, this is a vicious chair, it's breaking. That's, that's what I first thought when I sat down. Um, so virtue and vice is something that any object could, could possess. Uh, but the thing you need to understand about virtue and vice is it is linked to purpose. Uh, or as the, the term the Greeks would use would be telos, right? It's linked to the telos or the purpose of the object. And that is linked to the mind of the maker, to the person who made it. And this is why I want to start off talking about objects, because when you think of man-made objects, it's easy to discern the purpose. It's easy to discern the purpose because people put that purpose into them. It's, it's easy for you to pick up on because you yourself are a person and you understand how objects like, like chairs and like stages have been used historically. Um, the person who builds it has an idea that he wants to accomplish something with it or that somebody will want to accomplish something with it and he wants to make sure that he makes it well and he wants to make sure that it does its job well. Now trying to transfer that idea to people is difficult. It's difficult because you don't necessarily know the mind of the maker. That is, you don't necessarily know the person who made the object of the human. But that's what the Greeks were trying to figure out. They looked at human beings and they said, what is our purpose? And of course, your Greeks, your Romans, they believed that there, was, there were gods, and even in many philosophies, a supreme god. And they believed that, that we had design and that we had purpose, and they believed it was their job to ferret that out and to discover it. And of course, when you think about classical education, it really kind of has its roots, its beginning in classical Athens. And so to the Athenians of the classical era, 4th century BC, those guys considered their principal job, their main purpose, to be citizens in the polis, that is the city-state. They were a part of a community, and their job, as far as they could tell, was to be a good citizen. That was their purpose. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to cultivate in their young children the ability to be good citizens. They wanted to make sure that they were equipped and capable, especially of making political decisions. Because, of course, as if you're familiar with your ancient Greek history, you know that Athens was a democracy, um, at least for, uh, you know, young men, male citizens could vote. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that those citizens who were making decisions, and, and by the way, very democratic, right? They voted on everything. They did not vote on representatives. Uh, they did not vote for somebody else to make decisions for them. Whatever decision the city needed to make, the people needed to make it. They wanted to make sure the people making those decisions were well-equipped. They wanted to make sure that the people making those decisions were virtuous. They wanted to make sure that they possessed the qualities that Davies just mentioned up here a little bit ago. Justice, prudence, fortitude, and of course, uh, justice, prudence, fortitude, 
what's the fourth? What am I forgetting? Temperance, thank you, yeah. Self-control, justice, prudence, fortitude, temperance, self-control. They wanted to make sure that they had all of those qualities because the only way that you could be a successful uh, citizen is to, to, to be able to, to, to live that out. And so that's what ultimately set the foundation for education in the classical era. And of course, the Romans picked up on that. The Romans themselves in the third century, second century BC leading up into the empire also was a civitas, that was a state, and that state was governed by people. And they wanted to make sure that those people would be good people. And of course, the Christians would pick up on this. Now, having said all that, of course, I want to fast forward historically. Uh, again, kind of rehashing a little bit of what Davies already mentioned. But you go through the Enlightenment period, and all of a sudden, the focus of of discovery, the focus of philosophy of science has changed a bit. All of a sudden, people are looking for a discovery of just the, the mechanism and the, the, the workings of the universe. And pretty soon people start to say, hey, we've discovered so much, maybe we don't need to posit the idea of a God anymore. Maybe we don't need to appeal to supernatural uh, forces. Maybe we can unlock the mysteries of everything. And what happens as you get through the 17th century, the 18th century, up into the 19th century, increasingly more and more philosophers, more and more scholars and the such, they come to the conclusion that there is no need any longer to believe in a God. And so they reject that idea. Now, of course, uh, this is a slow working process, but eventually you get to where we are now, where I think a, a huge percentage of academia is atheist. Um, but once you get through this, what you need to understand is a lot of the things that we're noticing here that's playing out in the lives of our children, stuff that, that the academia, that the intelligentsia, that the students, college students, kind of figured out a long time ago. Late 19th century into the early 20th century, you had a lot of guys recognizing that there's no God. They recognize that if there's no God, there's no purpose. And if there's no purpose, of course, you cannot have any kind of value assessment of any kind. There's no virtue or anything of that nature. And of course, people started to really wrestle with that. And it, of course, sent many people in a dark place. Nihilism pops up at this particular time. And you literally had situations where people were in college classrooms and their professors were pleading with them not to commit suicide. You had a jump in suicide rates. Uh, in fact, I recommend the essay, The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus who is one of the forefathers of the existentialist movement. And he actually begins the essay, essay by saying that the only serious philosophical question is suicide. He says, now that we've realized that there is no God, trying to figure out why we should live is the only thing that really matters. No God, no purpose. No purpose, and then there's no value of any kind. Everything is just a cosmic accident. And so, that being the case, people started to ask, so why education at all? I mean, why do anything? What's the point? And of course, there were a lot of people who put forward different views. As I mentioned a moment ago, Camus was one of those guys. Existentialism was one of the movements. Um, and of course, something that Davies referenced a little bit ago, the pragmatic movement. Essentially, what happens is people say, well, there's no purpose, therefore I cannot discern why somebody ought to be here, um, and therefore I can no longer try to cultivate virtue in the life of a person, so let's focus on something else. And they said, well, what we can focus on is the stuff that we do know. We know what works. We know what's useful. We know what's pragmatic. And so let's make education about training people into practical stuff. And think about how, what kind of an impact this has had on our culture, right? If you think about our culture today, what's the first thing that you ask a person that you meet? aside from how are you doing or what's your name or something like that, you ask, what do you do? Uh, it's the first thing. Each of my students, whenever they graduate, you know, Leah was one of my former students. She graduated a couple years ago. As soon as they graduate, what's the first question that is asked of them? What are you going to do next year? And actually, it's not even as soon as they graduate, all year, from day one. I literally sit there and try to discipline my mind to get myself to not ask that of my students because just so you know, they're a little annoyed by it. They get so tired of hearing it every single time they talk to anybody new. What are you going to do next year? Because everything about who we are now is about what we're going to do, right? And the bottom line is, is what we're going to do, as you all know, does not in and of itself give a sense of fulfillment 
nor does it give a sense that you're actually doing, I mean, you might find that job, of course, that fulfills, and you might find that job, of course, that creates a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning in your life, but it is not the kind of thing that disconnected from everything else is going to, to, to keep you afloat. You, got, you know that life has to be so much more than that. And so, when we talk about classical Christian education, I want you to stop and to consider. And this is something I've heard many times today already. I've heard, you know, many, heard it said in many different contexts. But really, in order for this kind of education, the kind of education that the Greeks and the Romans envisioned, this paideia that Davies mentioned a little bit ago, this idea that you need to be enculturated as a whole person, in order for that to really be education, there must go with it the Christian part, right? Because here's the thing. In order to be educated, you have to have a purpose. In order to have paideia, you have to have a purpose because in order to have virtue, you have to have a purpose. But here's the thing that so many people just don't seem to realize anymore. If you do not have a God, then you do not have a purpose. You are literally a cosmic accident. And so these things have to go together. And I, I say all of this because I think it's incredibly important to constantly take your children, whether they be your students or your personal children, and bring them out of that utilitarian frame of mind, that, that, that thing that tells them to constantly assess themselves by how are they performing, what are they going to do next year, what are they going to do when they grow up, to try to get them out of thinking like that and to start thinking about what really matters to start getting them to think about their, their purpose, their meaning in life. You know, when I was, a, I went to public school. I was, a, I was not afforded the kind of education that, that we offer, which I think is probably true for many people in this room. And uh, I, most of my teachers, they didn't try, I mean, I don't want to say that I had all bad teachers. I'm sure I had some decent teachers. Not many of them very memorable, honestly. Um, <clears throat> but I do remember one who did, when I was a junior, try to get me to think about my meaning and purpose. He would ask me, why are you here? What's your purpose in life? And I would make fun of him. I would laugh about it. Um, and, and I remember that distinctly. I would never take it seriously. And, and I remember sitting next to one of my good friends who also made fun of him for it. Because the idea of having that weightiness of thinking about why I'm here was so disconnected because I never made that connection. And by the way, he didn't either. My teacher didn't either. He was an atheist. I think he was just fueled by this fact that there must be something more. There must be something more to it all. Perhaps you've uh, heard the story of Solon and Cressus, the king of Lydia, uh, recorded by uh, Herodotus, the historian. Solon was a great wise man from Athens, and he was traveling pretty much all throughout Turkey and through the Greek peninsula. And he was visiting various countries, and he was meeting with various kings and, and, and people of importance. And he met Cressus, who was the most powerful king in Turkey at that particular time. And when he met him, Cressus, of course, wants to show off. He wants to show him his great wealth. And so he takes him into his treasure houses, and he, he shows him all the gold in his possession. And the big thing he wanted, because he knew Solon by reputation, he knew Solon was a, a very respected man. He knew that Solon had been to a lot of places, had met a lot of people. And he says to Solon, Solon, I got a question for you. Who's the happiest person you've ever met? And Solon goes, that's easy. It's a guy named Telos, which I, I don't know if that's just an irony, that it just so happens the guy's name is Telos, if Herodotus is trying to sneak a lesson in there. You remember Telos means purpose? It's a guy named Telos. He lived a good life. He worked hard. He got married. He had kids. He got to see his kids grow up into adulthood, and he got to see them grow to be good men. And then he saw them have children. He lived to be a grandfather. And then in his 50s, he died defending the city that he loved. That's the happiest man I've ever met. Cressus was a little put off by that because he couldn't understand why he hadn't impressed Solon more. So he asks, well, who's the second best? And I don't want to get into the second one. It's another story similar. But at the end of it, Cressus is pulling his hair out. He's like, where do I fall on this list? Why am I not the happiest guy you've ever met? And Solon says to him, look, Sol uh, look, Cressus, it's easy to be happy in a moment. Anybody can do that. You're happy right now. And he says, however, what really matters is the whole thing. 
your life as a whole. It's not just how you live now, it's how you end. It's the whole process. It's the whole project. And he says, when your life has come to an end, then come and ask me. Then I'll be able to say whether or not you lived this full purpose. And Cressus, of course, like I did when I was a junior in high school, mocked him, said, get out of here, not interested. But it wasn't too long after that that Cressus' own kingdom, if you know his history, it fell to the great Cyrus, the Persian conqueror. And Cyrus took this king, as he was wont to do, and tied him up to a stake and was going to have him burned alive. And as Cressus was sitting there about to be burnt, he cries out, Solon, you were right. You were so right. And Cyrus stops. He says, he stops everything. He says, hey, who's this God you're calling out to? Cressus says, it's not a God, it's a man. And he tells him the story. And Cyrus was so impressed with the story, he let Cressus go and he welcomed him into his house and he let him be a servant in his house. And by all accounts, Cressus in his mind died a very happy man (laughs) by the end, even though he didn't have a bunch of stuff anymore. I, I say this because at the end of the day, When it comes to taking a look at your children, whether it be your students or your own personal children, how do you assess whether or not they have been trained in virtue? How do you assess whether or not it worked? And the real answer is you can't because you have to see the whole thing, right? Only God has a really good sense of that. You have to look at the whole picture because as long as they're growing This paideia is continuing to go along. It's not a thing that happens K through 12. It goes on for the rest of your life. So how do you assess it? In my mind, I think you take a look at little snapshots, little glimpses, little moments, and you take a look and you you see what's going on in that person's life. And, And I know when I sit here and I think about it, I think about my graduates. I think about a student who I had in seventh grade who when he was 30 years old, he sent me an email. Something years later, sends me an email, and he says, hey, uh, Mr. Velasco, he still calls me Mr. Velasco, Uh, I'm in a Bible study, and we're studying the book of Hebrews, and we came across Hebrews 6, and I've just been reading commentaries on it, I'm just curious, what do you think about it, can we talk about it? That is great. That guy's also a doctor. I'm more excited about that than by the fact that he's a doctor. But you know what? Him being a doctor, I think is all part and parcel of that. Again, the whole man, right? I, I think about a time when I was, uh, just this last year, I was at a cross-country race, and there were two runners that fell way behind everybody else. These two were much slower than everybody else in the, everybody else present. And I looked around, and all the spectators had gone, except for Ambrose students, who were sitting there at the line, clapping and cheering and and calling on these two student runners who were on the same team. None of their teammates were there. Their coaches weren't there. My students were. And I think, yes, good. We're getting it. This is a sign of us getting it. I think of a student who was actually a pretty poor student and didn't read much when we were giving reading assignments, uh, who spent a little bit of time in a hospital. And one of my colleagues went to visit him in the hospital. And when he went in, he noticed he was reading the Brothers Karamazov and was a good chunk of the way through it. And he said, why are you reading Brothers Karamazov? And he said, I loved the discussions that we had in class, and I really wanted to see what we were talking about. (laughs) (laughs) I think about all of those things, and I think that is the way we're supposed to measure what's going on. Looking for those little snapshots and always keeping our eyes on the prize, on the big picture on the telos, the end of the purpose, all right? And I'll welcome Davies back up. Thank you, guys.